Section 9 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 9. I think that now you should know this charming Gadsby family, so I will bring forth Lady Gadsby, about whom I told you at Gadsby's inauguration as mayor. A loyal churchwoman with a vocal ability for choir work, and with good capability on piano or organ, no woman could fill in in so many ways, and no woman was so willing and quick to do so. Gadsby had two sons, bright lads and popular with all. Julius was of a studious turn of mind, always poring through books of information, caring not what kind of information it was, so long as it was information and not fiction. Gadsby had thought of his growing up as a school instructor, for no work is so worthy as imparting what you know to any who long to study. But William, oh, hum! Our mayor and Lady Gadsby didn't know just what to do with him, for all his thoughts clung around girls and fashions in clothing. Probably our high school didn't contain a girl who didn't think that at no distant day Bill Gadsby would turn from a callow youth into a big catch husband, for a mayor's son in so important a city as ours was a mark for any girl to shoot at. But Bill was not of a marrying disposition, loving girls just as girls, but holding out no hand to any in particular, always in first-class togs, without missing a solitary fad which a young man should adopt, Gadsby's bill was a lion in his own right, with no girl in sight who had that tact through which a lasso could land around his manly throat. Gadsby had many a laugh, looking back at his own boyhood days, his various flirtations and such wild, throbbing palpitations as a boy's flirtations can instill, and looking back through just such ogling groups as now sought his offspring, until a girl, oh, so long ago, had put a stop to all such flirtations, and got that lasso on with a strangling hold, as Gadsby says, and it is still on today. But this family was not all boys. Oh, my, no. Two girls also sat around that family board. First following William was Nancy, who, as Gadsby laughingly said, didn't know how to grow, and now in high school was about as big as a pint of milk, and of such outstanding charm that Gadsby continually got solicitations to allow photographing for soft drink and similar billboard displays. No, sir, not for any sort of pay. In allowing public distribution of a girl's photo, you don't know into what situation said photos will land. I find daily photographs of girls blowing about vacant lots, all soggy from rains, also in a ditch with its customary filth, or stuck up on a brick wall or drawn onto an imaginary body showing a brand of tights or pajamas. No, sir, not for my girl. Fourth in this popular family was Kathleen, of what is known as a classical mold, with a brain which at no distant day will rank high in biology and microscopy. For Kathleen was of that sort which finds fascination in studying out many what's and why's amongst that vast array of facts about our origin. This study, which too many young folks avoid as not having practical worth, had a strong hold on Kathleen who could not sanction such frivolous occupations as cards, dancing, or plain school gossip. Not for an instant. Kathleen thought that such folks had no thoughts for anything but transitory thrills. But in biology, ah, why not study it and find out how a tiny microscopic drop of protoplasm can, through unknown laws, grow into living organisms, which can not only go on living, but can also bring forth offspring of its kind. And not only that, as said offspring must combat various kinds of surroundings and try various foods, why not watch odd variations occur? and follow along until you find an animal, bird, plant, or bug of such a total dissimilarity as to form practically a class actually apart from its original form. Kathleen did just that, and Gadsby was proud of it, and I think just a bit curious on his own part as to occasional illustrations in this studious young lady's school books. 
now it is known by all such natural faddists that any such a study has points in common with a branch akin to it and kathleen was not long in finding out that biology with its facts of animal origin could apply to a practical control of bugs on farms this word bugs is hardly biological but as kathleen is in this story with its strict orthographical taboo bugs must unavoidably supplant any classical nomination for such things so mayor gadsby sought branton hills council's approval for a goodly sum not only for such control but also for study as to how to plant in ordinary soil and not risk losing half a crop from worms slugs and our awkwardly brought in bugs this appropriation was a sort of prod showing this council that publicity of any first-class kind was good for a city and was casting about for anything which would so act until gadsby's son bill who you know thought of nothing but girls and dolling up found that branton hills had no distinction of its own in outfits for man or woman so why not put up a goal of say fifty dollars for anybody who could think up any worthy stunt in clothing which should go out as branton hills this or branton hills that possibly just a form of hat brim a cut of coat front or a sporting outfit and our worthy council did put up that goal and many brought all sorts of plans to city hall and bill won by thinking up a girl's always girls with bill hiking outfit consisting of a skirt with a rainproof lining which could during a storm form a rain suit by putting it on as bill said by substituting outwards for inwards this will hit bill amusingly as days go by going with it was a shirt with a similar turnout facility and a hiking boot with high tops as guards against thorns and burrs but which by undoing a clasp would slip off and lo you had a low-cut oxford for ordinary occasions in about a month a big cotton mill had work going full blast on branton hill's turn it out sport and hiking outfit and a small boot shop got out a pair of bill's two-part boots though saying that it would probably fall apart without warning but kathleen put on a pair and found it most satisfactory for a long rough hill climb hunting for bird and animal forms for biological study this proof of branton hill's goods was soon known in surrounding towns and that critical boot shop and big cotton mill had hard work to fill calls from canada holland russia spain and australia and bill was put upon branton hill's roll of honor end of section nine section ten of gadsby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kathy reynolds albany new york gadsby by ernest vincent wright chapter ten now i'll drop civic affairs for a bit and go on to a most natural act in this city of many young chaps and charming young girls which was slowly working up all through this history as mayor gadsby had occasion to find out sitting comfortably on his porch on a hot sultry august night amidst blossoming shrubs a dim form slowly trod up his winding pathway it was a young man plainly trying to act calmly but couldn't it was frank morgan our radio broadcasting boss you know who for many a month had shown what a romantic public calls a crush for gadsby's young nancy so a jolly call of what's on your mind boy rang out as frank sank wiltingly into a hammock wiping his brow of what i actually know was not natural humidity from an august night now gadsby who was as i said a gay lothario in his own youth saw right off what was coming and sat back waiting finally finishing a bad attack of coughing though frank hadn't any cold that young man said i uh, that is nancy and i or i will say that i want to that is i think nancy and i would and gadsby took pity on him right off nancy had always had a strong liking for frank both had grown up in Branton Hills from babyhood, and Gadsby thought back about that lasso which had brought him Lady Gadsby. 
now asking a girl's dad for that young lady's hand is no snap for any young swain and gadsby was just that kind of a dad who would smooth out any bumps or rough spots in such a young swain's path nancy wasn't a child now but a grown-up young woman so gadsby said frank lady gadsby and i know all about how much you think of nancy and what nancy thinks of you so if you want to marry our full wish is for a long and happy union nancy is out in that arbor down this back path and i'll watch that nobody disturbs you two for an hour at this grand turn of affairs frank could only gasp oh and a shadowy form shot down that dusky path and from that moonlit arbor anybody knowing how a man chirps to a canary bird would know that two young birds put a binding approval upon what his honor had just said many a man has known that startling instant in which dan cupid that busy young rascal took things in hand and told him that his baby girl was not a baby girl now and was about to fly away from him it is both a happy and a sad thrill that shoots through a man at such an instant happy and joyous at his girl's arrival at maturity sad as it brings to mind that awkward fact that his own youth is now but a myth and that his scalp is showing vacant spots his baby girl in a bridal gown his baby girl a matron his baby girl proudly placing a grandchild in his lap it's an impossibility but this big world is full of this kind of impossibility and will stay so as long as man lasts so nancy tiny happy laughing nancy was found through a conspiracy by dan cupid and frank morgan and right in all glory of youth youth ah what a word and how transitory but how grand as long as it lasts how many millions in gold would pour out for an ability to call it all back as with our musical myth faust during that magic part of a child's growth this world is just a gigantic inquiry box containing many a topic for which a solution is paramount to a growing mind and to whom can a child look but us adults any man who can't stop now to talk with a child upon a topic which to him is too silly for anything should look back to that day upon which that topic was dark and dubious in his own brain a child who asks nothing will know nothing that is why that bump of inquiry was put on top of our skulls end of section ten Section 11 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 11. But to go back to Nancy, it was in August that Frank had stumblingly told Gadsby of his troth and so along in april branton hills was told that a grand church ritual would occur in may may with its blossoms birds and balmy air an idyllic month for matrimony i wish that i could call this grand church affair by its common customary nomination but that word can't possibly crowd into this story it must pass simply as a church ritual all right so far so good so along into april all branton hills was agog awaiting information as to that actual day or i should say night gadsby's old organization of youth was still as loyal to all in it as it was way back in days of its formation days of almost constantly running around town soliciting funds for many a good municipal activity finally this group got cards announcing that on may fourth Branton Hills' first church would admit all who might wish to aid in starting Nancy and Frank upon that glamorous path to matrimonial bliss. May 4th was punctual in arriving. Though many a young girl got into that flighty condition in which a month drags along as though in irons and clock hands look as if stuck fast. But to many girls also, May 4th was not any too far away, for charming gowns and dainty hats do not grow upon shrubs, you know and girls who work all day must hurry at night at manipulating a thousand or so things which go towards adorning our girls of today. 
Now an approach to a young girl's big day is not always as that girl might wish. Small things bob up, which at first look actually disastrous for a joyous occasion, and for Nancy and Frank just such a thing did bob up. For on May 3rd a pouring rain and whistling wind put Branton Hill's spirits way, way down into a sorrowful slump. Black, ugly, rumbling clouds hung aggravatingly about in a saturation of mist, rain, and fog. And roads and lawns got such a washing that Nancy said, Anyway, if I can't walk across that front churchyard, I can swim it. That was Nancy, a small bunch of inborn good humor. And I'll say right now that it took good humor and lots of it to look upon conditions out of your control with such outstanding pluck. But young Dan Cupid was still around and got in touch with that tyrannical mythological god who controls storms and put forth such a convincing account of all Nancy's good points, and Frank's too, if anybody should ask you, that a command rang out across a stormy sky, calling all clouds, calling all clouds, all rain to stop at midnight of May 3rd, bright sun on May 4th, and no wind. So as Nancy took an anxious squint out of doors at about six o'clock on that important morning, and what young girl could go on calmly snoozing on such a day? Lo, old Saul was smiling brightly down on Branton Hills. Birds sang. All sorts of blossoming things had had a good drink. And a most glorious sky, rid of all ugly clouds, put our young lady into such a happy mood that it took a lot of control to avoid just a tiny bit of humidity around a small pair of rich brown orbs which always had that vibrating, dancing light of happy youth, that miraculous joy of living. And what a circus was soon going full tilt in Mayor Gadsby's mansion. If that happy man so much as said, now I, a grand womanly chorus told him that a man don't know anything about such affairs, and that a most satisfactory spot for him was in a hammock on his porch with a good cigar. That's it. A man is nominally monarch in his own family, but only so on that outstanding day upon which a bridal gown is laid out in all its glory on his parlor sofa, and a small mob of girls, and occasionally a woman or two, is rushing in and out, up and down stairs, and finding as much to do as a commonly known microscopic bug of prodigious hopping ability finds at a dog show. Rush, rush, rush! A thousand thoughts, and a million words, this crowd was all girls, you know, making that parlor as noisy as a sawmill. But Gadsby laughingly stayed out of it all, watching big armfuls of bloom and many a curious-looking box go in through that front door, flying hands rapidly untying glorious ribbon wrappings. Now upon all such occasions, you will find, if you snoop around in dining room or pantry, an astonishing loaf of culinary art, all fancy frosting, and chuck full of raisins and citron, which is always cut upon such an auspicious occasion and it is as hard to avoid naming it in this story as it is to withstand its assault upon your stomach. Oh, hum, now what? Aha! May 4th, lasting, as Nancy said, for about a million months, finally got Gadsby's dining room clock around to 6.50, only about an hour now to that grand march, past practically half of Branton Hill's population, for all who couldn't jam into that commodious church would stand around in a solid phalanx blocking all traffic in that part of town, for all Branton Hills was fond of its mayor's baby girl. But during this rush and hubbub, how about Frank? Poor boy. Now, if you think that a young lad at such an instant is as calm as a mill pond, you don't know romantic youth, that's all. About forty of Gadsby's old organization boys, now manly young chaps, had bought him a car, which Nancy was not to know anything about until that throwing of old boots and what is also customary, had quit. Frank didn't want to hold it back from Nancy, but what can a chap do against forty? Also, last night at a big so-sorry old chap party, Frank had found how loyal a bunch of old pals can turn out, and this grand launching into matrimonial doubt had put him in a happy mood for that all-important oration of two words, I do. So now I'll hurry around to church to find out how Nancy's organization girls put in a long day of hard labor, not only at floor work, but up on stools and chairs. 
My, my, just look and gasp. A long chain of lilacs runs from door to altar in two rows. And look at that big arch of wisteria and narcissus halfway along. Artificial palms stand in curving ranks from organ to walls, and with all lights softly glowing through pink silk hoods, and with gilt cords outlining an altar dais of moss and sprays of asparagus, it is a sight to bring a thrill to anybody, young or old. And now, aha! With organist and pastor waiting, a murmur and hand-clapping from that big front door told all who had luckily got in that Nancy was coming. It took thirty cars to bring that bridal party to church, for not a boy or girl of our old organization would miss this occasion for a farm with a pig on it with four kinks in its tail. Now, naturally, any girl would long to walk up that holy path with Nancy, but too many would spoil things. So by drawing lots, Nancy had for company Sarah Young, Lucy Donaldson, Priscilla Standish, Virginia Adams, Doris Johnson, and Cora Grant, with Kathleen as maid of honor as charming an array of youthful glory as you could find in all Branton Hills. Until this important arrival, Branton Hills' famous organist, just plain John Smith, was playing softly, just a song at twilight, watching for a signal from Mayor Gadsby, and soon swung into that famous march which brought forth a grand thrill as tiny, blushing, palpitating Nancy took Dad's arm, gazing with shining orbs at that distant, oh so distant, altar. Now I want to know why anybody should want to cry on such a grand occasion. What is sad about it? But many a lash was moist as that tiny vision of glamorous purity slowly trod that fragrant pathway. Possibly girls can't avoid it. Anyway, our Branton Hills girls didn't try to do so. Gadsby, as has many a good old dad, fought back any such showing. But I won't say that his thoughts didn't nag him. For giving away your baby girl to any young, though first-class chap, is not actually fun. But that long, long trail finally brought him to that mossy dais, at which Frank, coming in through a handy door, stood waiting. Nancy was as calm as a wax doll, but Frank stood shaking with a most annoying cough, of imaginary origin, as Pastor Brown stood, book in hand, now I won't go through with all that was said, nor say anything about Nancy's tiny, warm, soft hand as it was put in Frank's big clumsy fist by Pastor Brown, nor about that first holy kiss, nor that long, mighty roar of organ music as our happy, blushing pair trod that long pathway doorwards. You know all about it anyway, as most such rituals follow a standard custom. Nor shall I go into that happy hour at His Honor's mansion, during which that fancy loaf of frosting, raisins, and citron was cut, and which many a girl put in a pillow that night, nor of that big bridal bunch of blossoms, which was thrown from a stairway into a happy group of hopping, jumping, laughing girls. But I will say, shh, that Kathleen caught it, nor anything of Nancy and Frank's thrilling trip to Branton Hills' big railway station, in that gift car which Nancy thought was a king's chariot, nor of a grand low bow by old Pat Ryan of that station's trunk room. It was just that customary, all aboard, a crowd's hooray and good luck, with Branton Hills' municipal band a blaring and a mighty mob shouting and waving. End of section 11。section 12 of Gadsby。this is a LibriVox recording。All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 12. Oh, hum! I'll turn from this happy affair now and try to find out what was going on in this thriving, hustling city. Now you probably think of a city as a gigantic thing. For if you go up onto a high hill and look around across that vast array of buildings, parks, roads, and distant suburbs, you not only think that it is a gigantic thing, you know it is. But is it? Just stop and think a bit. All such things as bulk or width you know by comparison only. Comparison with familiar things. So just for fun, go up in an imaginary balloon about halfway to that old moon which has hung aloft from your birth, and possibly a day or two in addition, 
and look down upon your gigantic city. How will it look? It is a small patch of various colors, but you know that within that tiny patch many thousands of your kind hurry back and forth. Railway trains crawl out to faraway districts, and if you can pick out a grain of dust that stands out dimly in a glow of sunlight, you may know that it is your mansion, your cabin, or your hut, according to your financial status. Now, if that hardly shows up, how about you? What kind of a dot would you form in comparison? You must admit that your past thoughts as to your own pomposity will shrink just a bit. All this shows us that could this big world think, it wouldn't know that such a thing as man was on it. And man thinks that his part in all this unthinkably vast cosmos is important. Why, you poor shrimp! If this old world wants to twitch just a bit and knock down a city or two, or split up a group of mountains, man, with all his brain capacity, can only dash wildly about, dodging falling bricks. No, you wouldn't show up from that balloon as plainly as an ant, in crawling around our Capitol building at Washington. But why all this talk about our own inconspicuosity? It is simply brought up to accompany Nancy's thoughts as that train shot across country, for Nancy, until now, had not known anything approaching such a trip. So this happy, happy trip, back upon which many a woman looks with a romantic thrill, was astounding to such a girl. From Branton Hills to San Francisco, a boat to Honolulu, Manila, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Colombo, and finally Cairo. Ah, Cairo! In thinking of it, you naturally bring up two words, pyramids and sphinx, words familiar from school days. Practically from birth, Nancy, along with millions of folks, had known that famous illustration of a thing half lion and half woman, and a mountainous mass of masonry built for a king's tomb. So standing right in front of both, Nancy and Frank got that wondrous thrill coming from attaining a long, long wish. From Cairo to Italy, Spain, London, Paris, and that grand Atlantic sail, landing at Boston, and hustling by fast train, but how slow it did go, to Branton Hills. So along about Thanksgiving Day, about half of its population was again at its big railway station. For Nancy was coming back, and Frank too, if anybody should ask you. And with that big municipal band a-booming and blaring, and the crowd of our old organization girls pushing forward, did Branton Hills look good to Nancy? And did Nancy look good to Branton Hills? What a glorious tan, from days and days on shipboard. And was that old Atlantic ugly? Asked Frank, poor chap, who as on that big Pacific had found out just what a ship's rail is for, and that stomachs can turn most amazing flip-flops if an old boat is too frisky. In just an instant, actual count, Nancy was in Lady Gadsby's arms, fighting valiantly to hold back a flood of big happy sobs, and Frank was busy, grabbing a cloud of hands surging towards him. Coming back from a long trip is a happy occasion, and it is also mighty good to put a trunk or a bag down, knowing that it will stay put for a day or two anyway. That constant packing and unpacking on a long trip soon turns into an automatic function, and how Nancy did worry about what transportation customs in various lands would do to a first-class trunk, which has a romantic history, owing to its coming as a matrimonial gift from a group of loving girls. But now, ah, put it away, and your things around, in familiar disposal. Long trips do bring lots of fun and information, but a truly long trip is tiring, both in body and mind. But Nancy and Frank won't stay with Gadsby long, for during that trip, a charming bungalow was built on a lot of Gadsby's, facing City Park, and Nancy put in many days arranging things in it. Anybody who has had such joyful work to do knows how assiduously a young pair would go about it. For two young robins carrying bits of cotton and string up to a crisscross of twigs in a big oak, with constant soft loving chirps, had nothing, according to our popular slang, on Nancy and Frank. Finally, moving in day got around with that customary party to which you carry a gift to add to such things as a young husband on only a small salary can install. And how gifts did pour in! Rugs, chairs, small stands, urns, clocks, photos and wall mountings, dainty scarfs, all hand worked by our girls in our night school, books, lamps, a radio from station KBH, 
until finally a big truck found an opportunity in that coming and going throng to back in and unload an upright piano, all satin ribbon wrappings with a card from Branton Hills Municipal Band. End of section 12. Section 13 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 13. I could go on for hours about this starting out of Nancy and Frank, but many civic affairs await us, for Julius Gadsby, who has not got into this story up to now, had, from his constant poring through all kinds of books of information, built up a thorough insight into fossils, and you know that Kathleen is way up in biology, which brings in our awkward bugs again. Now bugs will burrow in soil, and always did from history's birth, building catacombs which at last vanish through a piling up of rocks, sand, or soil on that spot. Now Julius continually ran across accounts of important finds of such fossils, and with Kathleen's aid was soon inaugurating popular clamor for a big hall of natural history. This, Julius and Kathleen thought, would turn out as popular in a way as living animals out at our zoo. But an appropriation for a hall of natural history is a hard thing to jam through a city council, for though its occupants call for no food, you can't maintain such a building without human custody, which, said old Bill Simpkins, is but a tricky way of saying cash. But our council was by now so familiar with calls from that famous organization, and owing to its inborn faith in that grand body of hustling youth, such a building was built, Julius and Kathleen arranging all displays of fossil birds, plants, bugs, footprints, raindrop marks, worms, skulls, parts of jaws, and so on. And what a crowd was on hand for that first public day. Julius and Kathleen took visitors through various rooms, giving much data upon what was shown, and many a Branton Hills inhabitant found out a lot of facts about our vast past, about organisms living so far back in oblivion as to balk man's brain to grasp. Kathleen stood amongst groups of botanical fossilizations, with Gadsby not far away, as this studious young woman told school pupils how our common plants of today, through various transitions and form, show a kinship with what now lay, in miraculously good condition, in this big hall. And Julius told staring groups how this or that fossil did actually link such animals, as our cow or walrus of today, with original forms totally apart, both in looks and habits. And it was comforting to Gadsby to find pupils asking how long ago this was, and noting that amazing look as Julius had to say that nobody knows. Such a building is an addition to any city, for this big world is so old that human calculation cannot fathom it, and it will, in all probability, go on always. So it is improving a child's mind to visit such displays for it will start a train of thoughts along a path not commonly sought if such institutions do not stand as attractions. Now in any community a crank will bob up, who will, with loud acclaim and high-sounding words, avow that it is a scandalous drain on public funds to put up such a building just to show a lot of rocks, animals' ribs, and birds' skulls. But such loud bombasts only show up an orator's brain capacity, or lack of it, and actually bring studious folks to ask for just such data upon things which his ridiculing had run down. It is an old, old story that if you want a city's population to go in strongly for anything, and you start a loud, bawling campaign against it, that public will turn to it for information as to its worth. So just such a loud, bawling moron had to drift into our hall on its inauguration day, and soon ran smack up against Kathleen. That worthy girl, allowing him to blow off a bit, finally said, I know you. You run a stock farm. All right. You want to know all you can about matching and crossing your stock, don't you? I thought so. 
but god did all that long oh so long ago gradually producing such animals as you own today and all you can do is to follow along in your puny way and try to avoid a poor quality of stock mixing with yours this building contains thousands of god's first works it won't do you a bit of harm to look through our rooms nothing will jump out at you at that that barking critic shut up and gadsby slid outdoors chuckling that's my girl talking that's my kathlyn it is curious why anybody should pooh-pooh a study of fossils or various forms of rocks or lava such things grant us our only vision into natural history's big book and it isn't a book in first-class condition far from it just a tiny scrap a slip or possibly a big chunk is found with nothing notifying us as to how it got to that particular point nor how long ago man can only look at it lift it wrap it cut into it and squint at it through a magnifying glass and think about it that's all until a formal study brings accompanying thoughts from many minds and by such tactics judging that in all probability such and such a rock or fossil footprint is about so old natural history holds you in its grasp through just this impossibility of finding actual facts for it is thus causing you to think now thinking is not only a voluntary function it is an acquisition an art plants do not think animals probably do but in a primary way such as an aid in knowing poisonous foods and how to bring up an offspring with similar ability but man can and should think and think hard and constantly it is ridiculous to rush blindly into an action without looking forward to lay out a plan such an unthinking custom is almost a panic and panic is but a mild form of insanity so kathleen and julius did a grand good thing in having this hall as an addition to branton hills institutions now in any city or town or almost any small community you will find a building or possibly only a room about which said city or town has nothing to say it is that most important institution in which you put a stamp on your mail and drop it into a slot knowing that it will find its way across city or country to that man or woman who is waiting for it but how many young folks know how this mail is put out so quickly and with such guarantee against loss not many i think if you ask so gadsby holding up youth as a nation's most important function in its coming history thought that any act which would instruct a child in any way was worthy so on a saturday morning his honor took a group of grammar school pupils to a balcony in back of that all hiding partition and a postal official showing all mail handling acts individually said in this country two things stand first in rank your flag and your mail you all know what honor you pay to your flag but you should know also that your mail just that ordinary postal card is also important but a postal card or any form of mail is not important in that way until you drop it through a slot in this building and with a stamp on it or into a mailbox outdoors up to that instant it is but a common card which anybody can pick up and carry off without committing a criminal act but as soon as it is in back of this partition or in a mailbox a magical transformation occurs and anybody who now should willfully purloin it or obstruct its trip in any way will find prison doors awaiting him what a frail thing ordinary mail is a baby could rip it apart but no adult is so foolish as to do it that small stamp which you stick on it is you might say a postal official going right along with it having it always in his sight a giggling girl was curious to know if that was why a man's photo was on it possibly said our official laughing but wait a bit look downstairs as your mail falls in through that slot or is brought in by a mailman it is put through an ink daubing apparatus that's it right down in front of you which totally ruins its stamp how about your man's photo now a good laugh rang around and our official said now a man sorts it according to its inscription puts it into a canvas bag and aboard a train or possibly an aircraft but that bag has mail going to points a long way apart so a man in a mail car sorts it out so that chicago won't find mail in its bag which should go to california 
at this point our giggling girl said oh i had a christmas card for missouri go way down to mississippi how did you mark it i put m i s s for missouri try m o and i wish you luck as that laugh ran round our official said now you know that you can buy a long narrow stamp which will hurry your mail along so as all mail in this building is put up in many a small bunch all with such stamps attract a mailman who will so wrap a bunch that that kind of a stamp will show up plainly upon its arrival at a distant point a boy will grab it and hurry it to its final goal but that stamp will not hurry it as long as it is on that train our giggling girl swinging in again said what with that stamp right on top how can it said our official a train can only go just so fast stamp or no stamp oh our boys and girls got a big thrill from this visit in back of that partition and told gadsby so on coming out of that building our party saw a big patrolman putting a small boy into a patrol wagon that poor kid was but a bunch of rags dirty and in a fighting mood our boys got a big laugh out of it our girls though did not young marion hopkins who had that fairy wand you know at our airport inauguration said oh that poor child will that cop put him in jail mayor gadsby at which his honor instantly thought of a plan long in his mind branton hills had a courtroom a child's court in fact at which a kindly man looks out for just such young waifs trying to find out why such tots commit unlawful acts so gadsby said i don't know marion but i want you young folks to go on a visit tonight to our night court to find out about just such wild boys how many want to go to his satisfaction all did and so that night that courtroom had rows of young folks all agog with curiosity which a first visit to a court stirs up in a child just by luck our young vagrant in rags was brought in first shaking with childish doubt as to what was going to occur but that kindly man sitting back of that big mahogany railing had no thought of scaring a child and said calmly now boy what did you do that you ought not to do and why did you do it as our boys sat nudging and winking but with our girls growing sad from sympathy our young culprit said ah i grabs a bun and this big cop grabs my collar but why did you grab that bun it wasn't yours you know gosh man i was hungry hungry don't your folks look out for you no nah, i do my own looking and that's what i was doing too what had you for food all day just that bun and say i only got half of it that big cop was so rough did that cop as you call him hurt you hurt i should say not i put up a good stiff scrap i paid him back blow for blow no big gas bag of a cop is going to wallop this kid and not pay for it but boy don't your folks bring you up to know that it is wrong to rob anybody no nah, my dad robs folks and just got six months for it so why shouldn't i it's all right to do what your dad will do isn't it not always boy and our girls in row two and our boys in row four sat sad and glum at this portrayal of youthful sin finally that big kindly man thoughtfully rubbing his chin said whom did your dad rob i don't know it was a ford car nobody wasn't in it so why not grab it that's what dad said you can pick up a bit of cash for a car you know boss and say if a car brung only six months how long will i squat in jail for swiping this half bun ah go slow boss i ain't no bad kid only just a hungry mutt gosh how i wish i had a glass of milk from row two a young vigorous girlish form shot out dashing for a doorway and as that big kindly man was still rubbing his chin marion burst in again rushing sobbingly to that sad bunch of rags holding out a pint of milk and two hot biscuits a quick snatch by two horribly dirty young hands a limp flop on a mat at that big mahogany railing and a truly hungry child was oblivious to all around him and i'll say that our boys in row four had lumpy throats but finally that big kindly man said though taking things unlawfully is wrong conditions can occur in which so young a culprit is not at fault this young chap has had no bringing up but has run wild a child will not know right from wrong if not taught 
and as it is a primary animal instinct to obtain food in any way i will simply put this boy in a school which branton hills maintains for just such youths at this both row two and row four burst out in such a storm of hand clapping that gadsby found that this visit had shown his young folks from actual contact with a child without training how important child raising is and how proud a city is of such as act according to law end of section thirteen Section 14 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 14. In almost any big town around autumn, you will annually run across that famous agricultural show known as a county fair and as branton hills had a big park which you know all about right in front of nancy's and frank's small bungalow it was a most natural spot for holding it and so as this happy pair's third autumn got around stirring activity in that big park also got a-going for railings for stockyards don't grow all built yards and yards of brown canvas don't just blow into a park nor do hot dog and popcorn stands jump up from nothing, and Nancy, rocking on that bungalow porch, could watch all this work going on, and rocking was about all that Nancy could, or I should say, should do, just now. What a sight it was! Trucks, small cars, wagons, a gang with a tractor plowing up hard spots, a gang picking up rocks, grading humpy spots, and laying out ground plans, masons building walls, and all kinds of goods arriving by tons but out of all that confusion and ado a canvas town will grow strung from top to bottom with gaily flapping flags and hanging bunting and that customary midway with its long rows of gaudy billboards in front of which circus ballyhoo artists will continuously bawl and shout out claims about sword swallowing tattooing hula hula dancing boa constrictor charming or a punch and judy show at a county fair, two things stand out as most important. Farm stock and that oval track around which swiftly trotting colts will thrill thousands, and I'll say shrink a bank account or two. But of all sights, I don't know of any with such drawing ability for kids as just such a carnival lot. So daily, as soon as school was out, throngs of happy, shouting, hopping, jumping boys and girls would dash for that big park, looking pointing and climbing up on auto tops into lofty oaks onto tall rocks or a pal's back for if anything is difficult for a boy to obtain a sight of nothing in climbing that an orang outang can do will balk him so nancy sat calmly rocking 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 and but pardon i'll go on with this story all i know is that frank arriving from work at radio station kbh wouldn't so much as look at that big carnival lot but would rush in in a most loving solicitous way which always brought a kiss and a blush from nancy now if i don't quit talking about this young pair you won't know anything about that big show going up in front of that happy bungalow almost daily lady gadsby would drop in on nancy bringing all sorts of dainty foods and his honor with kathlyn julius and bill paid customary visits but that fair you say how about that fair ah it was a fair i'll say what mobs on that first day and what a din bands playing ballyhoo shouting popcorn a popping hot dogs a sizzling ducks squawking cows lowing pigs grunting an occasional baby squalling and missed it all a choking cloud of dust a hot autumn wind panting fanning matrons cussing husbands all working toward that big oval track at which all had a flimsy possibility of winning a million or two or a dollar or two oh you county fairs you bloom in your canvas glory annually you draw vast crowds you show high quality farm stock gigantic pumpkins thousands of poultry including our thanksgiving national bird you fill coops with fancy squabs fat rabbits and day-old chicks you show many forms of incubators, churns, farming apparatus, 
pumps, plows, lighting plants for small farms, windmills, bug poisons, and poultry foods, and you always add a big balloon, which you anchor so that kids may soar aloft until a windlass pulls it down. You fill us with food that would kill a wild goat, but you still last, and may you always do so. For within your flapping, bulging canvas walls, city man rubs against town man, rich and poor girls bump, snobs attain no right of way, and a proud, happy boy or girl shows a first-class satin ribbon which a lovingly brought-up calf or poultry brood has won. Only a satin ribbon, but displaying it to a group of admiring young pals brings to a child that natural thrill from accomplishing anything worthy of public acclaim. Such thrills will not crowd in as maturity supplants youth. And so I say, a trio of our customary huzzas for any child who can carry away a satin ribbon from a county fair. But what about our good mayor during all this circus hullabaloo? Did important thoughts for still improving Branton Hills pass through his busy mind? Not just now, but fond, anxious thoughts did, for his mind was constantly on Nancy, tiny, darling Nancy, his baby girl. For during that noisy carnival, folks saw, or thought so, you know, a big bird with long shanks and a monstrous bill, circling round and round that small bungalow's roof, plainly looking for a spot to land on. Lady Gadsby and old Dr. Wilkins saw it, too, and told Nancy that that big hospital which our old organization had built was holding a room for instant occupancy, and as that big bird daily swung down, 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 almost grazing that small roof, Frank, poor chap, as shaky as at his church ritual thirty months ago, stayed away from radio station KBH and stuck to that small bungalow as a fly sticks around a sugar bowl. Finally, on a crisp autumn night, that soaring bird shot straight down with such an assuring swoop that old Doc Wilkins, indoors with Nancy, saw it and said quickly, On your way, Nancy girl! And that part of Branton Hills saw his car racing hospitalwards, with Lady Gadsby fondly patting Nancy's tiny cold hands and saying just such loving things as a woman would, naturally, to a young girl on such a trip. But Gadsby and Frank? Ah! poor half crazy things no car would do at all no sir a car was far too slow and so across lots down into many a man's yard and jumping high walls shot two shadowy forms arriving at that big hospital badly blown just as lady gadsby and old doc wilkins took nancy's arms and got slowly to that big door with its waiting rolling chair now this stork's visit is nothing out of ordinary in world affairs. Millions and billions of visits has it, and its kind, flown, to King's Mansion or a black Zulu woman's hut. But this flight was poor Frank's initiation to that awful hour of blank panic, during which a young husband is boiling hot or icy cold in turn. God, how still a hospital corridor is! How doctors and assistants do float past without as much sound as falling snow. Oh, how long Frank and his honor sat, stood, or trod up and down, watching that room door. What was going on? Was Nancy all right? Oh, why this prolonging of agonizing inactivity? Can't anybody say anything? Isn't anybody around at all? But hospital doctors and nursing staffs, though pitying a young chap, must pass him up for that tiny lady, who now is but a tool in God's hands, in God's magic laboratory. And so, ah, Dr. Wilkins is coming, and smiling, a baby girl, and with a ripping good pair of lungs, but has to jump quick to catch Frank, who has sunk in a swoon, and Mayor Gadsby's collar is as limp as a dish rag. Ah, man, 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 and woman, 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 just you too god's only parts in his mighty plan for living actuality not only with man and animals but also down way way down amongst plants just two parts only two and baby you tiny bunch of wriggling gurgling humanity by that slowly ticking clock is your turn in this mighty world unavoidably arriving mamma papa and all of us will go on for a bit 
growing old and gray, but you, now so young and frail, will stand sturdily and willingly in our vacancy and carry on God's will. End of section 14「Section 15 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 15. As this is a history of a city, I must not stay around any part too long. So, as it was almost a small morning hour, Nina Adams, a widow, was sitting up, for Virginia, a high school girl, was still out, and around 2.30 was brought back in a fast car, two youths actually dumping an unconscious form on Nina's front porch and dashing madly away. But Nina Adams saw it, and calling for aid and carrying Virginia indoors, put in a frantic call for old Doc Wilkins, an old long-ago school pal, who found Nina frantic from not knowing Virginia's condition, nor why the pair of youths shot madly away without calling anybody. But it only took Dr. Wilkins an instant to find out what was wrong, and Nina, noting his tight lips and growing scowl, was in an agony of doubt. "'What is it, Tom? Quick! I'm almost crazy!' Dr. Wilkins, standing by Virginia's couch, said slowly, "'It's nothing to worry about, Nina. Virginia will pull through all right by morning.' But that didn't satisfy Nina Adams, not for an instant, and Dr. Wilkins, knowing that ironclad spirit of school days, which would stand for no obstructions in its path, saw that a blow-up was coming, but through a kindly thought for this woman's comfort, did not say what his diagnosis was, until Nina, now actually livid with worry, said, "'Tom Wilkins, Dr. Wilkins, if you wish, I claim a natural right to know why my child is unconscious, and you, a physician, cannot by law withhold such information. But Wilkins, trying to find a way out of a most unhappy condition of affairs, said, Now, Nina, you know I wouldn't hold anything from you if Virginia was critically ill, but that is not so. If you'll only wait until morning, you'll find that I am right." But this only built obstruction upon obstruction to Nina's strong will, until Dr. Wilkins, noticing coming total prostration, had to say, Nina, Virginia is drunk, horribly drunk. Drunk! Widow Adams had to grab wildly at a chair, sinking into it, at first as limp as a rag but instantly springing up, blood surging to a throbbing brow. Drunk! Drunk! My baby drunk! Tom, I thank you for trying to ward off this shock, but I'll say right now, with my hand on high, that I am going to start a rumpus about this atrocity that will rock Branton Hills to its foundations. Who got this young schoolgirl drunk? I know that Virginia wouldn't drink that stuff willingly. How could it occur? I pay through taxation for a patrolman in this district, in fact in all districts of this city. What is a patrolman for, if not to watch for just such abominations as this, pray? Dr. Wilkins didn't say, though probably thinking of a rumor that had run around town for a month or two. At this point, Virginia, partly conscious, was murmuring, Oh, Norman, don't! I can't drink it! Oh, I'm so sick! This brought forth all of Nina Adams' fury instantly. Aha! Aha! Norman! So that's it! That's Norman Anter, that low-down, good-for-nothing night owl, son of our big councilman Anter. So, it's Norman, I can't drink it. Tom Wilkins, this thing is going to court. About noon of that day, our good doctor, walking sadly along, ran across Mayor Gadsby in front of City Hall, and did his honor burn at such an abomination? What? High school boys forcing young girls to drink? and right in our glorious Branton Hills? Oh, but, Doc, this can't pass without a trial. That's all right, John, but a thorn sticks out right in plain sight. Thorn? Thorn? What kind of a thorn? And our mayor was flushing hard, as no kind of wild thoughts would point to any kind of thorns. That thorn, said Wilkins, is young Norman Anter, son of 
not of councilman anter i am sorry to say that it is so and wilkins told of virginia's half-conscious murmurings and nina wants to know why with a patrolman in all parts of town it isn't known that all this drinking is going on i didn't say what i thought but you know that a patrolman don't go into dancing pavilions and nightclubs until conditions sanction it who is supplying this liquor councilman anter but without knowing it all his honor could say was to gasp how do you know that doc and wilkins told of four calls for him in four days to young girls similarly drunk and my first call was to young mary anter's tiny grammar school kid who was as drunk as virginia but on coming out of it told of robbing anter's pantry in which liquor was always on hand for his political pals you know that poor kid taking it to various affairs and giving it to boys and winning popularity that way so said gadsby councilman antor's boy and girl brought up in a family with liquor always handy now with ignorant childish braggadocio bring councilman antor into this mix-up i'm sorry for antor but his pantry is in for an official visit it wasn't so long from this day that court got around to this rumpus to say that that big room was full would put it mildly although according to an old saying a cat is only as big as its skin that room's walls almost burst as groups of church organizations and law-abiding inhabitants almost fought for admission until standing room was nothing but a suffocating jam as gadsby and doc wilkins sat watching that sight gadsby said it's an outpouring of rightful wrath by a proud city's population who having put out good hard work in bringing it to its high standing as a community today will not stand for anything that will put a blot on its municipal flag which is right now proudly flying on city hall as wilkins was about to say so a rising murmur was rolling in from out back for norman antor was coming in in custody of a big patrolman and with four youths all looking not only anxious but plainly showing humiliation at such an abomination against trusting young girlhood scowls and angry rumblings told that high official way up in back of that mahogany railing that but a spark would start a riot so in a calm almost uncanny way this first trial of its kind in branton hills got along to a court official calling loudly virginia adams if you think that you know what a totally still room is by no kink of your imagination could you possibly know such an awful frightful hush as struck that crowd dumb as virginia a tall dark willowy stylish girl quickly took that chair from which truth in all its purity is customarily brought out but virginia was not a bit shaky nor anxious nor doubtful of an ability to go through with this ugly task gadsby and doc wilkins sat watching nina gadsby with profound sympathy but wilkins with an old school pal's intuition watching for a blow-up but nina didn't blow up that is not visibly but that famous rigid will was boiling full tilt boiling up to a point for landing tooth and claw on our pompous councilman's son if things didn't turn out satisfactorily virginia didn't occupy that stand long it was only a half-sobbing account of a night at a dancing pavilion and with a sob or two from a woman or girl in that vast crowd all virginia said was norman anter said i was a crybaby if i wouldn't drink with him but i said all right i am a crybaby and i always will turn crybaby if anybody insists that i drink that stuff just a short lull a valiant fight for control and but i had to drink norman was tipping my chair back and john allison was forcing that glass into my mouth i got so sick i couldn't stand up and didn't know a thing until i found i was on a couch in my own parlor a court official said kindly that will do miss adams during this nina was glaring at norman but virginia's bringing allison into it also was too much but wilkins watching narrowly said snappingly nina this is a courtroom now this trial was too long to go into word for word so i'll say that not only norman anter and allison but also our big pompous councilman anter according to our popular slang got in bad and branton hills dancing and night spots got word to prohibit liquor or shut up shop young mary anter was shown that liquor in dancing pavilions or in a family pantry 
was not good for young girls, and soon this most disgusting affair was a part of Branton Hills' history. And what vast variations the city's history contains! What valorous acts by far-thinking officials! What dark daubs of filth by avaricious crooks! What an array of past mayors! What financial ups and downs! What growth in population! But, as I am this particular city's historian, with strict orthography controlling it, this history will not rank in volubility with any by an author who can so broadcast all handy common words which continuously try to jump into it. End of section 15section 16 of gadsby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kathy reynolds albany new york gadsby by ernest vincent wright chapter 16 branton hills now an up to today's city Coming to that point of motorizing all city apparatus had just a last, solitary company of that class which an inhabitant frantically calls to a burning building. Company 4, in our big shopping district. All apparatus of which was still animal-drawn. Four big husky chaps, two blacks and two roans. Any thought of backing in any sort of motor apparatus onto this floor upon which this loyal four had, during many months, stood, champing at bits, pawing and whinnying to start out that big door, in daylight or night gloom, calm or storm, was mighty tough for old Dowd and Clancy, a man living day and night with such glorious, vivacious animals, grows to look upon such as almost human. Bright, brainy, sparkling colts can win a strong hold on a man, you know. And now... What form of disposal was awaiting Big Four, as Clancy and Dowd took a fond joy in dubbing this pair of blacks and two roans? Clancy and Dowd didn't know anything but that a mass of cogs, piping, brass railings, an intricacy of knobs, buttons, spark plugs, forward clutch, and so forth, was coming tomorrow. Ah, said Dowd moaningly, you know, Clancy, that good old light shifting about and that light stomping in that row of stalls at night, you know, old man, that happy crunching of corn, that occasional cough, that tail swatting at a fly or crazy zigzagging moth, that grand animal odor from that back part of this floor. I do, said Clancy. And now what? A loud whiz of a motor, a suffocating blast of gas, and a dom thing a-standin' on this floor with no brain, with nothin' lovin' about it, with no soul. Mm-hmm, said Dowd. I don't know about an animal having a soul, but it's got a thing not so dumb far from it. As Clancy sat worrying about various forms of disposal for Big Four, an official phoning from City Hall said just an ordinary common word, which had Clancy hopping up and down furiously mad. What's all this? What's all this? Dowd sang out, coming from a stall, in which a good rubbing down of a shiny coat and continuous loving pats had brought snuggling and nosing. Auction! said Clancy wildly, and sitting down with a thud. Auction? Auction for Big Four? What? Put up on a block as you would a Jap urn or a phony diamond? Uh-huh. That's what City Hall says. An awful calm slunk insidiously onto that big smooth floor as Dowd and Clancy, chins on hands, sat just thinking. Finally, Clancy burst out with, Ah! Oh, if an alarm would only ring in right now to stop my brain from cracking! Auction! Bah! A big crowd stood in City Park, including his honor, many a councilman, and, naturally, old Bill Simpkins, who was always bound to know what was going on. A loud, fast-talking man on a high stand was shouting, all right, you guys, how much, how much for this big black, a mountain of muscular ability, young, kind, willing, smart, how much, how much? Bids abominably low at first, but slowly crawling up, crawling slowly, as a boa constrictor crawls up on its victim. 
but without fail, as a bid was sung out from that surging, gawking, chin-lifting mob, a woman, way in back, would surpass it, and that woman hung on, as no boa constrictor could. Gadsby, way down in front, couldn't fathom it at all. Why should a woman want big four? A solitary animal, possibly, but four? So his honor, turning and making his way toward that back row, ran smack into Nancy. Daddy! Lady Standish is outbidding all this crowd. Aho, oh, so that's it. So Gadsby, pushing his way again through that jam and coming to that most worthy woman, said, By golly, Sally, it's plain that you want big four. John Gadsby, you ought to know that I do. Why, a man might buy that big pair of roans to hitch up to a plow or hook a big black onto an ash cart. I know that, Sally, but that small backyard of yours is... John, do your municipal occupations knock all past day's doings out of your skull? You know that I own a grand, big patch of land out in our suburbs, half as big as Branton Hills. So this big four will just run around, jump, roll, kick, and loaf until doomsday, if I can wallop this mob out of bidding. As Lady Standish was long known as standing first in valuation on Branton Hill's tax list, nobody in that crowd was so foolish as to hang on in a war of bidding against that bankroll. So Gadsby shook hands, put an arm about Nancy, walking happily away, as a roar of plaudits shot out from that crowd, for that loud, fast-talking man was announcing, Sold! All four to Lady Standish! As Gadsby and Nancy ran across old Bill Simpkins, Gadsby said, Bill, you know that grand old day. Look, a building is burning. A patrolman has put in an alarm. And now look, coming down Broadway, two big blacks and following on two big roans. What grand, mighty animals, nostrils dilating, big hoofs pounding, gigantic flanks bulging, mighty lungs snorting, monstrous backs straining, thick, full tails standing straight out coming sir coming sir just as fast as brain and brawn can and that gong clanging air splitting whistling shining sizzling smoking four tons of apparatus roars past grinding and banging on broadway's paving you saw all that bill uh-huh said simpkins but a motor don't hurt our paving so much as nancy took his honor's arm again gadsby said poor cranky old bill always running things down. But how about Clancy and Dowd? On moving out from that big park, that happy pair, if knighthood was in bloom today, would bow low and kiss fair Lady Standish's hand. End of section 16section 17 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 17. Oh, hum! Now that Nancy's baby's gurgling or squalling, according to a full tummy, or tooth conditions, and Nancy is looking, as Gadsby says, as good as a million dollars, I find that that busy young son of a gun, Dan Cupid, is still snooping around Branton Hills. And now who do you think is hit? Try to think of a lot of girls in Gadsby's old organization of youth. No, it's not Sarah Young, nor Lucy Donaldson, nor Virginia Adams. It was brought to your historian in this way. Lady Gadsby and his honor sat around his parlor lamp, his honor noticing that Lady G was smiling, finally saying, John, uh-huh, Kathleen and John Smith, what? I said that Kathleen and John Smith want to, oh-ho, aha, I'll call up Pastor Brown to start right off dolling up his big church. No, no, not now, wait about six months. This is only a troth. Folks don't jump into matrimony that way. Hmm. I don't know about that, said Gadsby, laughing, and thinking way back to that captivating lasso. John Smith was Branton Hill's famous church organist, and at a small dainty lunch, Kathleen told of this trough. In a day or two, about all Branton Hill's young girlhood had, on rushing in, 
told Kathleen what a grand chap John was, and all that town's young manhood had told John similar things about Kathleen. So as this is a jumpy sort of a story anyway, why not skip months of happy ardor and find how this tying of an additional knot in our mayor's family will turn out? You know that Kathleen don't think much of pomp or show, and such a big church ritual as Nancy had is all right if you want it. But Kathleen had fond thoughts of just a small parlor affair, with only a group of old chums, and no throwing of old boots and sharp food grains, which work downward to scratch your back or stick in your hair as stubbornly as burrs. Such crazy doings, said Kathleen. Always look foolish. It's odd how anybody can follow up such antiquarian customs. As Kathleen's big night was drawing nigh, Lady Gadsby and Nancy had constantly thought of a word synonymous with woman, and that word is scrub, which is saying that Gadsby's mansion was about to submit to a gigantic scrubbing, painting, dusting, and so forth, so that Kathleen should start out on that ship of matrimony from a spick-span wharf. Just why a woman thinks that a grain of dust in a totally inconspicuous spot is such a catastrophic abnormality is hard to say. But if you simply broach a thought that a grain of it might lurk in back of a piano or up back of an oil painting, a flood of soap suds will instantly burst forth, and any man who can find any of his things for four days is a clairvoyant or a magician. As Gadsby sat watching all this, his thoughts took this form. Isn't it surprising what an array of things a woman can drag forth, burrowing into attics, rooms, and nooks? Things long out of mind, an old thing, a worn-out thing, but it has lain in that room, nook, or bag until just such a riot of soap and scrubbing brush brings it out. And, as I think of it, a human mind could and should go through just such a ransacking occasionally, for you don't know half of what an accumulation of rubbish is kicking about, in its dark, musty corridors, old fashions and thoughts, bigotry, vanity, all lying stagnant. So why not drag out and sort all that stuff, discarding all which is of no valuation? About half of us will find in our minds a room having on its door a card saying, It was not so in my day. Go at that room right off. That my day is long past. Today is boss now. If that my day could crawl up on today, what a mix-up in world affairs would occur. Ox cart against aircraft, oil lamps against arc lights, slow mail information against radio. But as all this stuff is laid out, what will you do with it? Nobody wants it. So I say burn it, and tomorrow morning how happy you will find that musty old mind. But his honor's mansion finally got back to normal as clouds of dust and swaths and slaps from dusting cloths had shown Lady Gatsby and Kathleen that that parlor was simply awful, though Gatsby, Julius, and Bill always had thought that it looks all right, causing Kathleen to say, a man thinks all dust stays outdoors. Though marrying off a girl in church is a big proposition, it can't discount in important data doing a similar act in a parlor. For as a parlor is a mighty small room in comparison with a church, you can't point to an inch of it that won't do its small part on such an occasion. So a woman will find about a thousand spots in which to put tacks from which to run strings holding floral chains, sprays, or small lights. So Gadsby, Bill, and Julius, with armfuls of string and mouthfuls of tacks, not only put in hours at pounding said tacks, but an occasional vigorous word told that a thumb was substituting. But what man wouldn't gladly bang his thumb or bark his shins on a wobbly stool to aid so charming a girl as Kathleen, and on that most romantically important of all days? Anyway, that day's night finally cast its soft shadows on Branton Hills, night with its twinkling stars, its lightning bugs, and its call for girls' most glorious wraps, and youth's swallowtails, and tall silk hats is Cupid's own, lacking but organ music to turn it into utopia. And was Gadsby's mansion lit up from porch to roof? No, only that parlor and a room or two upstairs, for wraps, mascara, a final hair quirk, a dab of lipstick, for Kathleen, against all forms of vain display, said, I'm only going to marry a man, 
not put on a circus for all Branton Hills. All right, darling, said Gadsby. You shall marry in a pitch-dark room if you wish, for as you say, a small parlor affair is just as binding as a big church display. It's only your vows that count. So but a small group stood lovingly in Gadsby's parlor, as Parson Brown brought into unity Kathleen and John. Kathleen was radiantly happy, and John, our famous organist, was as happy with only charming Sarah Young at an upright piano as any organist in a big choir loft. But to Lady Gadsby and his honor, this was, in a way, a sad affair, for that big mansion now had lost two of its inhabitants, and as many old folks know, a vast gap or chasm thus forms backward across which flit happy visions of laughing romping happy girlhood happy hours around a sitting-room lamp and loving trips in night's small hours to a room or two just to know that a small girl was all right or that a big girl was not in a draft but though marrying off a girl will bring such a vacancy that happy start out into a world throbbing with vitality and joy can allay a bit of that void in a big mansion or a small cabin a birth, a tooth, a growth, a mating, and again a birth, a tooth, and so on. Such is that mighty law, which was laid down on that first of all days, and which will control man, animal, and plant until that last of all nights. So it was first Nancy and now Kathleen, and Branton Hills gossips thought of Bill and Julius, with whom many a young romantic maid would gladly sit in a wisteria drooping arbor on a warm moonlit night flighty maids with bill adoring his high-class social gossip studious maids with julius finding much to think about in his practical talks on physics zoology and natural history but bill and julius had shown no liability of biting at any alluring bait on any matrimonial hook and gadsby winking knowingly would say bill is too frivolous just now and julius too busy at our hall of natural history but just wait until Dan Cupid starts shooting again and watch things whiz. End of section 17. Section 18 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gadsby by ernest vincent wright section eighteen sarah walking along past city park on a raw cold night found a tiny oh so tiny puppy whining shaking and crying with cold picking up that small bunch of babyhood sarah was in quandary as just what to do but priscilla standish coming along said oh poor baby who owns him sarah i don't know but say wouldn't your ma my ma would bring him along and wrap your cloak around him it's awfully cold for so young a puppy so lady standish with that backyard zoo soon had his quaking baby ship lapping good warm milk and a stumpy tail wagging as only a tiny puppy's stumpy tail can wag along towards six o'clock a vigorous pounding on lady standish's front door brought priscilla to find old Bill Simpkins with a tiny, wildly sobbing girl of about four. Walking into Lady Standish's parlor, Simpkins said, This kid has lost a, a, a critter. I think it was a pup, wasn't it, kid? A vigorous up-and-down bobbing of a small shock of auburn hair. So, said Simpkins, I thought it might show up in your backyard gang. It has, Bill, you old grouch. For Lady Standish as about all of Branton Hills' grown-ups, was in school with Bill. It's all right now, and warm and cuddly. Don't cry, Mary, darling. Priscilla will bring in your puppy. As that happy baby sat crooning to that puppy, also a baby, old Bill had to snort out, Ha! Huh, a lot of fuss about a pup, I'll say. Oh, poo poo, Bill Simpkins, said Lady S. Why shouldn't a child croon to a puppy? Folks bring all kinds of animals to my backyard, if sick or hurt. Want to walk around my zoo? No. No zoos for Councilman Simpkins. Animals ain't worth so much fuss. Pshaw, Bill. You talk ridiculously. I wish you could know of about half of my works. I want to show you a big Angora cat. 
A dog bit its foot, so I put a balm on it and wound it with cotton. You put balm on a cat's foot? Bah! But Lady Standish didn't mind old Bill's ravings, having known him so long, so said, Oh, how's that old corn of yours? Can't I put a balm? No, you cannot. Mary, bring your pup. I'm going along. As a happy tot was passing out that big kindly front door, Sarah said, Was Councilman Simpkins always so grouchy, Lady Standish? No, not until John Gadsby cut him out, and one Lady Gadsby. Aha! And a ho-ho, said Sarah, laughing gaily. So folks had what you call affairs way back just as today, and also laughing inwardly at what Lucy had said about this kindly Lady Standish and his honor. Ah, that good old school day, now so long past. How it bobs up nowadays. If you watch a young lad and a happy giggling lass holding hands or laughing uproariously at youthful witticisms, and how diaphanous and almost imaginary that far back day looks if that girl with whom you stood up and said i do laughs if you try a bit of romantic kissing and says why john how silly you act actually childish and now it won't do any harm to hark back a bit on this history to find how our big night school is doing following that first graduation day many and many a child and adult too had put in hours on various nights, and if you visit it, you will find almost as many forms of instruction going on as you will find pupils, for thousands of folks today know of topics which, with a bit of study, could turn out profitably. Now Branton Hills had, as you know, built this school for public instruction, and as with all such institutions, visiting days occur, and what a display of goods and workmanship! and what bright, happy pupils, standing proudly back of it. For mankind knows hardly a joy which will surpass that of approval of his work. Gadsby's party first took in a woodworking shop, finding small stands which fit so happily into many a living room nook, book racks for walls or floor, moth-proof bins, smoking stands, many with fancy uprights or inlaid tops, high chairs for tiny tots, armchairs for old folks, cribs, tobacco humidors, stools, porch and lawn swings, ball bats, rolling pins, mixing boards, in fact about anything that a man can fashion from wood. As an indication of practical utility coming from such public instruction, a man told Gadsby, I didn't know much about woodworking tools until I got into this class. This thing I am making would cost about thirty dollars to buy but all it costs so far is two dollars and a half for wood and glass, which Gadsby thought was worth knowing about. As so many of his council had put forth so many complaints against starting such a school without charging for instruction. In an adjoining room, his honor's party found boys banging and pounding happily, and if you should ask, noisily, on brasswork, making bowls, trays, lamp standards, photograph stands, book supports, and similar artistic things. Across from that was a blacksmith's shop with its customary flying sparks and sizzling cooling vats. But by going upstairs, away from all this din, Gadsby, humming happily, found Sarah and Lucy, Nancy and Kathleen, amidst a room full of girls doing dainty fancy work. And what astonishing ability most of that group did show. Nancy bought a baby cap, which was on a par with anything in Branton Hills shops. And though Kathleen said it was just too cunning for anything, John Smith's bungalow didn't contain anybody just now whom it would fit. But Lady Gadsby, with a party of Branton Hills matrons, was calling for Gadsby to hurry down a long corridor to a loom room, saying that such dainty rugs, mats, and scarfs of cotton and silk hung all around on walls or racks. It was truly astonishing that girls could do such first-class work having had long hours of labor in Broadway's shops all day. Although most of our standard occupations found room for activity, an occasional oddity was run across. So his honors party found two boys and two girls working at that always fascinating art of glass blowing. And what a dainty trick it is, and what an opportunity to burn a thumb or two if you don't wait for things to cool. Things of charming form and fragility grow as by a magician's wand 
from small glass tubings of various colors, birds with glorious wings, ships of crystal sailing on dark billows, tiny buildings in a thick glass ball, which upon agitation stirs up a snowstorm, which softly lands on pink rooftops, many a fancy drinking glass and bowl, oil lamps, ash trays, and gaudy strings of tiny crystal balls for adorning party gowns. And did Nancy want to buy out this shop? And did Frank doubt his ability to do so? And did Kathleen ask, How about it, Johnny? And did John Smith say, Nothing doing? It was just that, but it only shows that good old Branton Hill's inclination for aiding anything which looks worthy. And such a school, I know you will admit, looks that way. Tramping upstairs, still again, Gadsby and his party found a class so varying from all downstairs as to bring forth murmurs of joy, for this was known as music floor, upon which was taught all forms of that most charming of all arts, from solo work to community singing, from solitary violin pupil to a full brass band. On our party's arrival, Lucy, Doris, and Virginia, hurrying from classrooms, sang in trio, that soft, slow Italian song, O Solo Mio, and as Gadsby proudly said, not for many a day had such music rung out in Branton Hills. For most girls, if in training with a practical vocalist, can sing, and most charmingly, too. In a far room was a big string outfit of banjos, mandolins, and guitars, happily strumming out a smart, throbbing Spanish fandango, until his honor could not avoid a swinging of body and tapping of foot causing Lady Gadsby to laugh, saying, Rhythm has a mighty grip on Zulus, I am told, to which our swaying mayor said, Anyway, a Zulu has a lot of fun out of it. If singing, playing, and dancing could only crowd out sitting around and moping, folks would find that a Zulu can hand us a tip or two on happy living. But all music is not of string form. So, in a big auditorium, our party found a full brass band of about fifty boys, with a man from Branton Hills Municipal Band as instructor. Now, as Gadsby was, as you boys say, not at all bad on a big bass horn in his youthful days, this band instructor, thinking of it, was asking him to sit it and play. So, as Lady Gadsby, two girls and two sons-in-law, sat smiling and giggling in a front row, and as fifty boys could hardly play from laughing that big horn got such a blasting that it was practically a horn soul and nancy doubling up from giggling said did did d daddy if, 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 if barnum's circus hits town you must join its c c clown band but i had to rush this happy party out of that building as an awful thing was occurring but a block from it which told its own story by a lurid light flashing through windows, clanging gongs, shrilling horns, and running, shouting crowds. For an old, long, vacant factory building, just across from City Hall, was blazing furiously, rushing along Broadway, was that motor thing, with Clancy and Dowd clinging wildly on a running board. Pulling up at a hydrant, Clancy said to his honor, As I was a-hanging on to this dumb thing, a thinkin' it was going to bang into a big jam at two crossroads, I says, by girl, that big pair of blacks wouldn't bang into nothin'. But this crazy contraption, it ain't got no brain, no nothin', no soul, nothin' but halitosis. As Gadsby took a long look at Clancy's dumb thing, a vision was wafting through his mind of a calm, sunny patch of land, way out in Branton Hills suburbs on which, day by day, two big blacks and two big roans could, anyway, taking all things into account, a big conflagration, with its din, rush, and panic, is no spot for such animals as Big Four. As for old Bill's squawk about animals ruining our paving, Gadsby thought that was but small talk, for paving, anyway, can't last for long. But that is a glorious spot way out amongst our hills. Gadsby took his party to a room in City Hall, from which that burning factory was in plain sight, and as Nancy and Kathleen stood watching that awful sight, a big wall, crashing down, had a crowd rushing to that spot. A man's form was brought out to a patrol wagon, and a boy rushing past City Hall sang out to Gadsby, It's old man Donaldson! Tiny Nancy, 
almost swooning, said, Donaldson? Oh, Kathy, that's Lucy's dad of company, too, you know. And Frank and John Smith shot wildly downstairs to find out about it. In an instant, a sobbing girlish form was dashing madly from that night school building towards our municipal hospital. It was Lucy, bright, always laughing Lucy, but half an hour ago singing so happily in that girl's trio. As that big factory was still blazing furiously, Frank and John, coming in, said, It was only a scalp wound and a sprung wrist. Lucy is coming upstairs now. Lucy, coming in, badly blown from running and fright, said, That wall caught Daddy, but it was so old and thin it didn't crush him. Oh, how I worry if that alarm rings. But, put in Nancy, it's man's work. Pshaw, what good am I? Why, I couldn't do a thing around that factory right now. Look at my arm, about as big as a ball bat. And as Frank took that sad, tiny form in his arms, Gadsby said, All throughout natural history, Nancy, you will find man built big and strong, and woman small and frail. That is so that man can obtain food for his family, and that woman may nourish his offspring. But today, I am sorry to say, you'll find girls working hard in gymnasiums, fondly hoping to attain man's muscular parity. How silly! It's going straight against all natural laws. Girls can find a lot of bodily good in gymnasiums, I'll admit. But not that much. And as for your ball bat arm, as you call it, what of it? You'd look grand now, wouldn't you, with Frank's big oak branch arms hanging way down to your shins. But that ball bat arm can curl around your tiny baby as softly as a down pillow. Ah, oh, darling, don't say you can't do anything, for I know you can. How about our old organization of youth days? You, and Nancy now laughing, said gaily, Oh, ho, our old organization, what fun it was. But, Daddy, I don't know of any young crowd following us up. No, our young folks of today think such things too much work. And, as that old factory was but a mass of ruins now, and midnight was approaching, Gadsby's family was soon in that mythical land of Nod, in which no horns blow, no sparks fall, only occasionally a soft gurgling from a crib in Nancy's bungalow. End of section 18 Section 19 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Section 19. It is an odd kink of humanity which cannot find any valuation in spots of natural glory, but such kinks do run riot in man's mind occasionally, and Branton Hills ran up against such on a council night, for a bill was brought up by old Bill Simpkins for disposal of City Park to a land company for building lots. At first word of such a thought, Gadsby was totally dumb from an actual impossibility of thinking that any man bringing up such a bill wasn't plumb crazy. What? Our main park? Including our zoo? Just that, said Simpkins, just a big patch of land and a foolish batch of animals that do nobody any good. You can't hitch a lion up to a city dump cart, you know, nor a hippopotamus to a patrol wagon. What good is that bunch of hair and horns anyway? And that park, bah, just grass, grass, grass. Branton Hills pays for planting that grass, pays for sprinkling it, pays for cutting it, and throws it away. So I say put it into building lots and draw good, solid cash from it. An Italian councilman, Tony Badamita, was actually boiling during this outburst, and in a flash, as Simpkins quit, was up shouting, I got a for bambinos. My bambinos plays in the data park. Run, jumpa, and rolla. Roll big and strong. My woman say no coulda do that a if play a all day on brick -a walks I say no bunch of land sharks buy that a park. How many you guys go to it anyway, huh? Not many, but go walk around, sniff at its blossoms, look at Grand Busha, sit on soft a grass. You do that a 
and I know you not stick to building on it. So at Mayor Gadsby's instigation, council did not ballot on Simpkins' bill, and said it would go, as Tony thought, only right, and look at a good abusha. In a day or two, this pompous body of Solons was strolling about that big park. No man with half a mind could fail to thrill at its vistas of shrubs, ponds, lawns, arbors, fancy fowl, small pavilions, and curving shady pathways. As Gadsby was taking his own a look, a old Bill Simpkins coming a snorting and a fussing along, sang out gruffly, All right, this is it. This is that grand patch of grass that pays Branton Hills no tax. But Gadsby was thinking, and thinking hard, too, finally saying, Bill, supposing that any day you should walk along that big pathway known in Sunday school as our straight but narrow way, you would find coming towards you all sorts of folks, a king roaring past in his big chariot, a capitalist with his hands full of bonds, an old, old lady on a crutch. Such passings would bring to you various thoughts, but supposing it was a possibility that you saw Bill Simpkins coming your way. Aha! What an opportunity to watch that grouchy old... That what? I'll say it again. That grouchy old crab. How you would gawk at him, that most important of all folks to you. How you would look at his clothing, his hat, his boots. That individual would pass an inquiry such as you had not thought it a possibility to put a man up against. Bill, I think that if you should pass Councilman Simpkins on that big pathway, you would say, what a grouchy old critter that was. Old Bill stood calmly during this oration, and looking around that big park, said, John, you know how to talk, all right, all right. I'll admit that. Things you say do a lot of good around this town. But if I should run across this guy you talk about, on that vaporous highway, or boardwalk, as I should call it, I'd say right out, good and loud, Hi, you, hurry back to Branton Hills and put up a block of buildings in that silly park. And Gadsby, walking away, saw that an inborn grouch is as hard to dig out as a wisdom tooth. Now this council's visit on this particular day was a sly plan of Gadsby's, for his honor is, you know, youth's champion, and having known many an occasion on which youth has won out against council opposition. So our big city officials, strolling around that park, soon saw a smooth lawn upon which sat, stood, or ran, almost a thousand small tots of from four to six, in dainty, flimsy outfits, many carrying fairy wands. It was a sight so charming as to thaw out a brass idol. Amidst this happy party, stood a tall shaft or mast, having hanging from its top a thick bunch of long ribbons, of pink, lilac, gray, and similar dainty colors, and around it stood thirty tots, thirty tiny fists all agog to grasp thirty gay ribbons. Old Bill took a look and said growlingly to his honor, What's all this stuff, anyway? Bill and Branton Hills Council, said Gadsby, today is May Day. That day so symbolic of budding blooms, mating birds, and sunny sky. You all know, or ought to, of that charming custom of childhood of toddling round and round, a tall mast in and out, in and out, thus winding gay ribbons about it in a spiral. That is but a small part of what this park can do for Branton Hills. But it is an important part, for happy childhood grows up into happy adults. And happy adults, looking right at Councilman Simpkins, can form a happy city council. Now a kid is always a kid, and a kid knows just how any sport should go. So just by luck, a tot who was to hold a gay ribbon didn't show up, and that big ring stood waiting for that round and round march just couldn't start with the ribbon hanging down. But a kid's mind is mighty quick and sharp. And a small tot of four had that kind of mind, saying, Oh, that last ribbon, isn't anybody going to hold it? 
Now historians shouldn't laugh. Historians should only put down what occurs. But I, your historian of Branton Hills, not only had to laugh, but to roar. For this tot, worrying about that hanging ribbon, saw our big pompous council group looking on. Now a council is nothing to a tot of four, just a man or two standing around. So, trotting up and grasping old Bill's hand, this tot said, You'll hold it, won't you? What? And Simpkins was all colors on throat and brow, as Branton Hills Council stood grinning. But that baby chin was straining up, and a pair of baby arms was pulling oh so hard. And in a sort of coma, big, pompous, grouchy Councilman Simpkins took that hanging ribbon. A band struck up a quick march, and round and round trod that happy singing ring, with old Bill looming up as big as a mountain amongst its foothills. Laugh? I thought his honor would burst. As that ribbon spiral got wound, Simpkins, coming back, said with a growl, I was afraid I would tramp on a kid or two in that silly stunt. It wasn't silly, Bill, said Gadsby. It was grand. And Tony Batamita sang out, Good a-work, Councilmana. My four bambinos walk a right in front of you, and twist her ribbons. Simpkins, though, would only snort and pass on. End of section 19 Section 20 of Gadsby This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 20. On a warm Sunday, Kathleen and Julius, poking around in Branton Hills suburbs, occasionally found an odd formation of fossilization, installing it amidst our Hall of Natural History's displays. Shortly following such an installation, a famous savant on volcanic activity, noting a most propitious rock formation amongst Julius groups, thought of cutting into it. For ordinary most prosaic rocks may contain surprising information, and upon arriving at Branton Hills Railway Station, ran across old Pat Ryan, czar of its trunk room. Ah, my man, I want to find a lapidary. A what? It isn't a what, it's a lapidary. A lapidary, is it? Lapidary, lapidary, lap a lap a la No, I... Now this savant was in a hurry and said snappily, But a city as big as Branton Hills has a lapidary, I trust. Oh, Branton Hills has a lot of things. But wait a bit. It ain't a lavatory what you want, is it? But at this instant, to old Pat's salvation, Kathleen, passing by, said, All right, Pat, I know about this and both taking a taxi, old Pat walking round and round, scratching his bald crown, was murmuring, Lapid, oh ho, I got it. It's probably a critter up at that zoo. I ain't forgot that hop, skip, and jump walloping Australian tornado, and now his honor has put in a lapidary. I think I'll go up with that old canvas bag. But why all sich high-brow stuff and naming critters? This lapidary thing might turn out only a rat or a goofy bug. But that fairy bug, Dan Cupid, goofy or not, as you wish, was buzzing around again, and though this story is not of wild romantic infatuations in which rival villains fight for a fair lady's hand, I am bound to say that Cupid has put on an act varying much from his works in Gadsby's mansion, for this arrow from his bow caught two young folks to whom a dollar bill was as long, broad, and high as City Hall. Both had to work for a living, but by saving a bit off and on, Sarah Young, who, you know, with Priscilla Standish, first thought of our night school, and Paul Johnson, who did odd jobs around town, such as caring for lawns, painting, and man-of-all-work, had put by a small bank account. Paul was an orphan, as was Sarah, who had grown up with a kindly old man, Tom Young, his old woman dying at about Sarah's fourth birthday. That word old woman is common amongst Irish folks and is not at all ungracious. It had to crawl into the story through orthographical taboos, you know. But Sarah, now a grown young lady, had that natural longing for a spot in which a woman might find that joy of living, 
in having things to do for just us two, if bound by Cupid's gift, matrimony. Many a day in passing that big church of Nancy's grand display, or Gadsby's rich mansion, Sarah had thought fondly about such things, for as with any girl, marrying amidst blossoms, glamour, and organ music was a goal to attain which was actual bliss. But such rituals call for cash, and lots of it, too. Also, old Tom Young had no room in any way fit for such an occasion. So Sarah would walk past, possibly a bit sad, but looking forward to a coming happy day. And it wasn't so far off. My no. As Nancy had thought April was a million months long, Sarah's days swung past in a dizzy whirl, during which, in company with Paul on Saturday nights, a small thing or two was happily bought for that Cupid's coop, as both found a lot of fun in calling it. But Sarah naturally had girl chums, just as Nancy and Kathleen had. For most of that old organization was still in town, and many a gift found its way to this girl, who, though poor in worldly goods, was as rich as old King Midas in a bright, happy disposition. For anybody who didn't know that magic captivation of Sarah Young's laugh, that rich crown of light fluffy hair, or that grand proud upright walk, wasn't amongst Branton Hills' population. Paul, scratching around shady paths, a potato patch or two, front yards, backyards, and city parks, was known to many an old family man, who upon knowing of his coming variation in living conditions, thought way, way back to his own romantic youth. So Paul, going to Sarah at night, brought small but practical gifts for that coop. As Sarah and Paul stood in front of City Hall on a hot July night, Sarah scanning Branton Hills Post for vacant rooms, who should walk up but his honor? And that kindly hand shot out with, Aha! If it isn't Paul and Sarah. What's Sarah hunting for, Paul? Sarah is looking for a room for us, sir. Us? Did you say us? Oh ho! Hmm! I'm on. How soon will you want it? Oh, said Sarah, blushing, not for about a month. But, said his honor, you shouldn't start out in a room. You would want from four to six, I should think. Sarah, still ogling that rooms column, said softly, Four to six rooms? That's just grand if you can afford such. But, wait, said Gatsby, who, taking Paul's and Sarah's arms and strolling along, told of a small six-room bungalow of his, just around from Nancy's. And you two will pay just nothing a month for it. It's yours from front porch to rooftop, as a gift to two of my most loyal pals. And instantly a copy of Branton Hills Post was blowing across Broadway in a fluky July wind. Now, as this young pair was to start out frugally, it wouldn't do to lay out too much, for as Sarah said, about forty words by a pastor, and a kiss. So only Priscilla stood up with Sarah, and Bill Gadsby in all his sartorial glory with Paul in Parson Brown's small study, both girls in dainty morning clothing, Sarah carrying a bunch of gay nasturtiums, claiming that such warm bright colorings would add as much charm to that short occasion as a thousand dollars worth of orchids. Now such girls as Sarah, with that capacity for finding satisfaction so simply, don't grow as abundantly as hollyhocks, and Paul found that Gatsby's old organization was a group knowing what a dollar is. Just a dollar. End of section 20「Section 21 of Gatsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 21. Occasionally a sight bobs up without warning in a city, which starts a train of thought, sad or gay, according to how you look at it. And so, Lucy, Priscilla, and Virginia Adams, walking along Broadway, saw a crowd around a lamp post, upon which was a patrol box. And though our girls don't customarily follow up such sights, Lucy saw a man's form sprawling flat up against that post, as limp as a rag. Priscilla said in disgust, Ugh! It's Norman Antor, drunk again! And Virginia, 
hastily grasping both girls' arms and hurrying past, said, So, his vacation in jail didn't do him any good, but still, it's too bad. Norman is a good-looking, manly lad, with a good mind and a thorough schooling. And now look at him, a common drunk. Priscilla was sad, too, saying, Awful, awful for so young a chap. What is his dad doing now? Still in jail, was all Virginia could say, adding sadly, I do pity poor young Mary, who sold Anter's liquor, you know. Doris says that lots of schoolgirls snub that kid. Now that's not right. It's downright horrid. Mary was brought up in what you almost might call a pool of liquor, and I don't call it fair to snub a child for that, for you know that not only past Councilman Anter, but also Madam Anter, got what our boys call lit up on many public occasions. Anter's pantry was full of it. Which way could that poor kid look without finding it? You know, Mary is not so old as most of us, and I'm just going to go to that child and try to bring a ray of comfort into that young mind. That rum-guzzling Anter family. Ugh! But a city also has amusing sights, and our trio ran plump into that kind, just around a turn, for standing on a soapbox, shouting a high-sounding jargon of rapidly shot words, was Arthur Rankin an original organization lad, a crowd of boys, a man or two, and a woman hanging laughingly around. Our trio's first inkling as to what it was all about was Arthur's hail to Priscilla. Aha! Branton Hill's fair womanhood is now approaching. Now, if our trio didn't know Arthur so thoroughly, such girls might balk at this publicity. But Priscilla and Arthur had had many a slapping match long ago arising from childhood spats. Priscilla originally living on an adjoining lot and was Arthur's first girl, which according to his old Aunt Anna was just silly puppy stuff. So nobody thought anything of this public hail, and Arthur was raving on about, which puts an instant stop to all pain, will rid you of anything from dandruff to ingrowing nails, will build up a strong body from a puny runt, will grow hair on a billiard ball scalp, and taboo it on a lady's chin. We'll put a glamorous gloss on tooth or nail, stop stomach growls, oil up kinky joints, and bring you to happy, smiling days of utopian bliss. How many, Priscilla? Only a dollar a box, two for dollar sixty. Priscilla, laughing, said, Not any today, thank you, Art. All I want is a pair of juicy lamb chops, a dish of onions, a dish of squash, a dish of carrots, a pint of milk. Potato chips, hot biscuits, cold slaw, custard pudding, nuts, raisins. Whoa, Priscilla, hop right up on this box. I know that word slinging ability of old. And as that crowd was fading away, Priscilla said, This is odd work for you, Arthur. You so good a draftsman. What's up? And Arthur, a happy, rollicking boy, having always had all such things as most boys had, with a dad making good pay as a railroad conductor, told sadly of an awful railway smash-up which took Dad away from four small Rankin orphans, whom Arthur was now supporting, and a scarcity of jobs in Branton Hills and of trips to surrounding towns, always finding that old sign out, no work today. Of the soapbox opportunity bobbing up, which was now bringing in good cash. So our girls found that our Branton Hills boys didn't shirk work of any kind if brought right up against want. End of section 21